chapter 13. We're going to pick up Paul's sermon here in verses 38 to 43 and look at Paul's conclusion to this awesome sermon in Antioch toward Pisidia at the synagogue there. Paul has been preaching Christ, and Paul starts preaching Christ by starting with the Old Testament, starting in Israel's history, and he's looking back at the wonderful, awesome, and mighty works of God toward these Israelite people, and now the message of this salvation, he says, the word of this salvation has come to them. They're sitting there in the synagogue, and God has visited them with this message of a great Savior that he's risen a great Savior that he's provided. The Davidic king, according to promise, is being preached to them. And if they will but lay hold of him by faith, they can be saved. They can have their sins forgiven. They can be delivered. And this is great news. This is the greatest news that they will ever hear. This is the greatest news that you will ever hear. And to the degree that you don't get that, is to the degree that your heart is still in bondage to sin. I mean, this is the greatest news that you could ever possibly hear. This is deliverance from sin. This is forgiveness. This is an eternity with Christ, sons of God, heirs of the promise. This is great and glorious news. And here they are sitting in this synagogue in Antioch, and Paul is there to preach it to them. And as he goes through the Old Testament history, as he goes through the Scriptures, opening up the Scriptures to them, they have already established by God, and now even in this sermon, building up this great anticipation. They look at their history of sin, 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 failure, rebellion, depravity. And in the context of that history, God faithfully saving, God faithful to his promise, God delivering them. Delivering them from captivity, delivering them from the sword, delivering them from the famine, delivering them from pestilence, giving them food in the desert, giving them meat in the desert, giving them water in the desert, giving them his law in the desert, choosing them as his people, choosing their fathers, as the Bible says, and then exalting the people. This is an awesome, awesome story. This is his story. This is God's story of his deliverance, despite their great, great depravity, despite their rebellion against him. But now this is all building up here to God's pronouncement through Paul that he has raised for them a Savior. They've had this great anticipation. There's a great hope on their part for this deliverer, for the messianic king to come. Now think about this for a second. This great anticipation is built in them through their knowledge and understanding of their own sin. If there's no anticipation in your heart whatsoever for the forgiveness of God, if there's no anticipation in your heart whatsoever for a deliverer for you, then you need to come to an understanding or a knowledge of your sin. You need to come to understand your condition before God and let God, allow the Spirit of God to build that anticipation in you. You need to see your sinful condition, and that comes only by God opening eyes and opening ears. This story reminds me, this sermon and how this is building up reminds me a lot of the road to Emmaus, right? Luke 24, when the disciples are walking along, they don't know that it's Christ speaking to them. And it says how Christ, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Just like Paul in this sermon in Acts 13, Christ began with the Old Testament prophets, with Moses. And he taught them along the road all the things that the scripture said about him. The scripture points to Christ. All of history culminates in Christ. He's teaching that to them. And they responded after he had vanished from their sight. He said, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? On that road to Emmaus, as Christ is teaching them, their heart within them burned. They saw scripture pointing to Christ. They saw God's deliverance in Christ. Their hearts burned within them. Your heart should burn within you when you hear God's word and you hear God's provision for your sin. When you hear of faith, when you hear of repentance, when you hear of the things of God to you, should not your heart burn within you about the things of the Lord? That's where the delight in God's word comes from. This should burn within us, these great truths from Scripture. 
History culminates in Christ as those Old Testament saints look forward to the anticipated deliverer. We as New Testament saints look back on the cross and we praise God out of a grateful heart that he has risen for us a savior. Christ is the fulfillment of promise. Christ is, as we looked at last week, the fulfillment of prophecy. Only Christ perfectly has fulfilled all of prophecy in Scripture, literally. And if you look at that prophecy, it's amazing to me that anyone that honestly, truthfully, just sits down and looks through Scripture and looks at those prophecies, it would be astonishing to me how anyone could honestly say that Christ isn't the Messiah. It is devastatingly true, devastatingly clear, Christ is the Messiah. He has perfectly fulfilled all of that prophecy. And listen, if he did it literally the first time, Christ will do it literally the second time. He will come and literally and perfectly and completely fulfill all of the prophecy still remaining. And that's the Lord that we serve. That's our risen Lord. But now, that fulfillment of prophecy comes loaded down with warning. And that's we're going to look at more of that warning today. It comes laden with warning. Beware, beware which side of the prophecy that you are on. Acts 17, 31 says, because, be warned, beware, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, Christ. And he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Be warned. Believe on Christ or prepare for an unbelievable judgment. Embrace forgiveness or face unfathomable fury. Thus says the Lord to the prophet Jeremiah in 21.8, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. And to the Romans, Paul said, Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. This is both the goodness and severity of God. This was, this concept, this understanding of sin, this understanding of God's deliverance was etched into the consciousness of these Jews sitting in the synagogue. It was engraved on the granite of their consciousness to the Old Testament Israelite. They had this as a part of who they were. It was woven into their fabric, this understanding of God, blessings and cursings, life and death, sin and blood and death. It was etched into who they were. And I remember thinking through that, just certain examples in Scripture, 2 Samuel 6, where Uzzah reached out to steady the ark, the holy ark, and he just reached out to steady it with his hand, and God killed him. Remember Mount Sinai, God's voice thundering from the heavens, the lightning, the clouds, the smoke rising as a furnace, the people stopping their ears, not able to, to stand the voice of God, not even able to approach the mountain or they'd be killed, right? God is holy. We look back through scripture at the story of God delivering his people, but the judgment that came at the hand of God, captivity, the sword, famine, pestilence, the judgment of God is a great judgment. But in the course of this, there's sin always before them. As David said in Psalm 51, my sin is always before me, right? It's constantly before him. And sin has driven what to them was an insurmountable wedge between the people and God. It just absolutely could not be overcome by them. And this wedge, this sin, meant sure death. Death. Death, their sin was always before them. And this was never more clearly seen than in the rituals that they were to do. God set up for the people, and this is going to provide context for the rest of Paul's sermon here. God set up for the people object lessons with respect to their sin. And God, we're going to see today, has set up an object lesson for us with respect to sin in the same way. But they had object lessons. And one of these object lessons was the sacrificial system. Worship, communion with God was inconceivable to them apart from sacrifice, apart from blood, apart from death. Worship was impossible. Communion with God, right standing with God, was impossible apart from sacrifice. And this came with an inner heart attitude of repentance and the outer ritual of sacrifice. Both were required. Hebrews 9.22 says, And according to the law, 
almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. Now, imagine the yoke that was placed on the Israelite people and the Jewish people in the Old Testament with the sacrificial system. Imagine, if you ever thought about what that system entailed for them, their sin in a real, everyday, rubber-meets-the-road, practical way was constantly in front of their face by means of this sacrificial system. And I want you to get an insight into that. In Exodus, the story of Exodus deals with the location of worship, the tabernacle, and the setting up of the tabernacle and how the tabernacle was made. In Leviticus... In Leviticus, we get the story of how the people were to worship God, how they were to go about communion with God, how they were to attain nearness to God, how they were to worship Him, and that included this heart attitude. Now, in chapters 1 through 7 of Leviticus, we get an explanation of the offerings, of the sacrifices. There were other sacrifices that had to be done, the drink offering, the drink sacrifice, the incense offering in Exodus. But here in Leviticus, you've got basically five types of sacrifices that the Jewish people had to make. There was a burnt offering, one, that was to make atonement for sin. They gave a burnt offering. There was a grain offering. There was a peace offering, peace offering after atonement to make peace with God. There was a sin offering, which was a sacrifice for repentance. And listen, this sin offering was for unintentional sin, not deliberate sin, unintentional sin. And lastly, there was a guilt offering or a reparation sacrifice. This was also a sacrifice of repentance, but this guilt reparation sacrifice underscored the need for restitution. Uh, The restitution must be made. Now, these five sacrifices were dealt with or were instituted to cover sins of omission, the things that you should have done that you didn't do, and sins of commission, the things that you did. But now bear in mind, that was done not knowingly, unintentionally, not deliberately. It dealt with expiation, which is the removal of guilt, and propitiation, which is the wrath satisfaction, the satisfaction of wrath. Sin in all of this was the issue. Why was there a need to remove the guilt? Sin. Why was there a need to make propitiation? Because God was furious because of their sin. It's sin, sin. Sin was always in front of their mind, always in their face. These sacrifices were made daily, one in the morning, one in the evening. Every Sabbath, every month, every festival week, festival years, done according to schedule, these sacrifices were done constantly. Overwhelmingly, the sacrifice was an animal. There were occasions when someone didn't have the resources to provide a bull or a ram or a goat that someone could make a grain offering. But listen, the thing that was sacrificed was that which is most costly, That which is most valuable was that given to the Lord. If there was a bull, that's what you gave, not the grain, right? It was that which is most costly. And this instilled in them that sin was costly, that death was costly. This was bloody, and this was costly, and this was valuable. This is something that took total commitment on their part to keep up. Overwhelmingly, this was an animal, a bull, a goat, or a sheep. These animals must have been pure, without blemish. In Malachi, God rebukes the Israelites for bringing to him sacrifices that were lame and blind. This was to be the first and best of your flock given to God. Now, these offerings derive from the word korban, which means gift. But korban literally has the meaning that it means a thing brought near. It was the gift that brought near. Now, what that underscores, these offerings, these sacrifices, is that in order to come near to God required this blood sacrifice. This was all about how do you get near to God who is holy. God is holy, completely separated from sin. Even to be near to God, even to be called the people of God, required death and blood sacrifice. Now, here's how it would work. If you were a worshiper, you would present, you would come to the temple, the tabernacle. You would present the sacrificial victim. You would lay your hand on the sacrificial victim. And that doesn't mean merely merely touch. That Hebrew word talks about placing pressure. You would lay your hand, put pressure 
I'm the sacrificial victim, and you, the worshiper, not the priest, you yourself would slit the throat of the sacrifice and drain his blood. You yourself would do that. The worshiper kills the animal, and that, in killing that animal, it's an irrevocable gift to God. That animal could no longer return, obviously, to profane use. It was set apart wholly to God. You lost that animal. Right? And those were valuable to the people. They were costly to the people. The worshiper was responsible for skinning the animal, for quartering the animal, for washing the entrails and washing the legs. Now think about it. You're going to repent of your sin. You're going to turn from your sin. You've committed sin, either a sin of omission. Boy, I should have done that and I didn't. Or a sin of commission. I did that even though you did it unintentionally. And you are to do that. You are to skin the animal. You're to drain its blood. You're to wash the entrails and the legs. You're to quarter the animal. The priest then would take the blood, scatter it over the inner or outer altar, depending on the seriousness of the sin. And in Leviticus 17, verse 11, the Bible says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And here's why you do it. I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. This is sin. There's sin always before them, and there's sin in an object lesson always seen in letting of blood, in the killing of the sacrifice constantly before their eyes. And this was done, again, for those done unwittingly, not done deliberately. Numbers 15 says, this is verses 27 to 31, and if a person sins unintentionally, then he shall bring a female goat in its first year as a sin offering. Let's turn there together. Numbers 15. Numbers 15. Let's see this together. And look at verse 27. Numbers 15. Down in verse 27. Can you, you're starting to get an idea of what they were faced with. Daily, weekly, monthly, annually, every feast, every new moon, every Sabbath, making sacrifices, killing the sacrificial animal, draining the blood, scattering the blood on the altar, all for sin. Numbers 15, verse 27, and if a person sins unintentionally, then he shall bring a female goat in its first year as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for the person who sins unintentionally. When he sins unintentionally, you see that repeated several times there? When he sins unintentionally before the Lord to make atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. You shall have one law for him who sins unintentionally, for him who is native born among the children of Israel, and for the stranger who dwells among them. That's a foreshadowing of this great promise that, yeah, not just Israel can be saved. You could be saved. Gentiles could be in on this. Verse 30, but the person who does anything presumptuously... Whether he is a native born or a stranger, that one brings reproach on the Lord, and he shall be cut off from among his people because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. And that person shall be completely cut off. His guilt shall be upon him. Constant awareness of sin, sins done unintentionally, the grievous reparation for sin done intentionally, high handed sin. All sin can be repented of. These are sins that God took very seriously, always in front of their eyes, always the sacrifice, always the shedding of blood. There was a daily sacrifice, morning and evening, 780 lambs per year. There was a Sabbath sacrifice done every Sabbath, two each Sabbath, 104 lambs per year. There was the new moon sacrifice done each month, 24 bulls, 12 rams, 96 lambs, 12 goats, 144 animals per year. There was the Passover sacrifice, 14 bulls, 7 rams, 49 lambs, 7 goats, 77 animals per year. There was the festival of Pentecost, 2 bulls, 1 ram, 7 lambs, 1 goat, 11 animals per year. There was the feast of trumpets, 1 bull, 1 ram, 7 lambs, 1 goat, for a total of 10 animals. There was the festival or the feast of tabernacles, 199 animals sacrificed. There was the atonement, the day of atonement, 13 animals sacrificed. On the Day of Atonement, in one case, uh, the, the priest would come each year, lay his hand on one of the goats, transfer the sin of the people, and then let that goat go into the wilderness. I imagine that goat didn't know what was happening to him. It was sort of like the, the turkey that the president pardons every year at Thanksgiving. You don't know how lucky you are, that one escape goat that got out. We get that word scapegoat. William Tyndale translated the Bible into English in 1530, and this word in Hebrew literally means the one that was delivered or the one that escaped. 
And so William Tyndale translated that escape goat. That's where we get our word today, scapegoat from. But this, that's the one that escaped of all of these animals. Now, that's, think about it. Nationally, over the course of a year, that's over 1,300 sacrifices. 1,300 times that the priest, the worshiper, went, slit the throat of the animal, drained the blood, and went through this festival in the eyes, in the witness of the people. 1,300 times. Now, think about this. That did not include the untold thousands that the people brought for their own sin. It was said that the number of animals that was required to sustain the sacrificial system was a miracle in and of itself by God. That God would have had to miraculously provide that number of animals for this system to be sustained. Now that is death. <laughs> that is blood. That is sin ever before their eyes. Continuous object lesson about their sin. I am so polluted, so corrupted, I can't even come near to God without a death sacrifice, without the shedding of blood. And I have to maintain that continuously in order to even commune with him on a regular basis. That's how serious God views sin, death, blood, sin constantly. This is bloody and costly. And you can see how nationally, just for the people, the priests, how many animals had to be sacrificed, how costly that was. And then imagine you as a family. Let's say you got five kids. <laughs> and you have to, for sin, you are making atonement for sin. You're giving a sacrifice for sin. You're bringing your sacrifice. Constant, constant understanding. Constant reminder. A constant understanding of their sin before God. Access to God, what this teaches us, access to God is impossible without righteousness. Impossible without you being clean. Impossible with your sin, laden down with your sin. Now, that object lesson, the law in the Old Testament, should provide for you an understanding of the law in the New Testament. For you, for me, the same object lesson comes to us through the just, holy, and good law of God. When you look into the law of God, you should see sin, 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 always before your eyes. You should see your condition before a holy God and how you cannot be in his presence with that sin. Sins of omission, sins of thought, sins of attitude, sins of word, sins of deed, sins of your heart, sins of your mind. The sins that you do, sins against other people, sins of your emotions, sins out of the depravity of your nature, always before your eyes because of the law, the piercing law, the mirror of God's law. That should be an object for you, an object lesson for you continuously in the same way that the sacrificial system was to bring them to an understanding of their wickedness before a holy God. The law of God today should have the same effect. Look at the sin in my life when you look at God's laws and you've broken every one of them and you've broken them repeatedly and without remorse. That is sin, sin, sin constantly. Romans 3, 19 and 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Outside of Christ, even the plowing of the wicked is sin. If you are of your father the devil, you can do nothing to please God. It is only sin. Sin, sin, sins of thought, sins of word. These folks that are sitting in the synagogue in Antioch toward Pisidia, listening to Paul preach this sermon because of the Old Testament sacrificial system, because of what they understood of Judaism, they saw their sin and they greatly anticipated the promised deliverer. It's constant sin. If you are outside of Christ and you're breathing God's air, it is sin. Anything not done in faith is sin. Sin. 
You were created for God's glory, and from your birth you have failed to live for that purpose. Your very existence now has become sin, and your sin has separated you from God. And there can be no communion with God in your sin. You must be made clean. You must be made righteous. You must have the righteousness of another. You have none of your own. You cannot please God. There is only sin. 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 And then you raise, you see in Acts chapter 13, God raising a Savior. Behold Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In Acts 13, 38, then he says, at this part of our sermon, therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. Isn't that an awesome, the culmination of this sermon to this point, when Paul says, through this man, through Christ Jesus, the forgiveness of sin, praise God. God, Isn't that an awesome thought. The forgiveness of sins. This was astounding mercy. This is radical redemption. Radical forgiveness. Radical mercy. This was the greatest news they could ever hear. Forgiveness of sins. An amazing thought. That should have the same effect on us today. The law of God, when you're wrecked with your own sinfulness, and yet God has raised a Savior. When you see yourself in the mirror of God's law, and you see your heart for what it is, and you see yourself outside of Christ, and outside of that forgiveness, outside of that mercy, unable to commune with Him, and then yet God has raised a Savior, and through that man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. That's the context of how they would have heard this exclamation, would have heard this sermon, and it was powerful, powerful to some and to others, not so much. We'll see that. Point one on your notes, believe on Christ for radical justification. Believe on Christ for radical justification. Back in Acts 13, verse 38, the Bible says, Therefore, let it be known to you. That let it be known are arresting words. They're words that, is, that have come as the result of the entire sermon that has preceded this point. All of their history, all of their rebellion, all of their wickedness, and now, preaching Christ, Paul says, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. In verse 38, Radical justification involves a radical, a truly radical forgiveness. This is comprehensive in nature. This is definitive. This is all of your sins, not part. You understand the, the, the glorious reality of that? It's not that you sin, omission or commission, and you have to go again, and you have to go again, and you have to go again with the animal sacrifice. Through one sacrifice for sins, once for all, Jesus Christ paid the price. Jesus Christ went to the cross and died once for all. Famous words on the cross, it is finished. It is complete. It is fulfilled. It is done. All complete. All done in Christ Jesus. This is comprehensive, and it is definitive. It is definitive through this man. Through no one else, through nothing else, not through the sacrificial system any longer. You can't get right with God that way. Right with God comes through faith in Christ. Justification, being right with God, comes through faith in Christ alone. Now this is diav, or you Greek guys, with a genitive. It's a, a genitive of means. It means that Christ was the means by which this was accomplished. Christ, everything here, the key to all that is offered by God, the key to this forgiveness is Christ. Now, this idea of forgiveness here, I want you to understand, necessitates repentance. If you are seeking forgiveness, it necessitates a recognition of wrongs that you have done. It's, it necessitates an understanding of your sinfulness. It necessitates repentance. There is no forgiveness without repentance. There is no faith without repentance. You must turn from your sin. Verse 39, and by him 
Everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. In verse 39, the first part there, radical justification comes through a radical means, and that is the means of faith. That by him is pushed forward in the clause. We've talked about that before. In the Greek language, they do that for emphasis. It's by him that everyone who believes is justified from their sins. This is justification. Justification basically is this. It is a legal standing before God. It's, it's being able to stand before God as if you had never sinned. Now think about that. Justific that is a radical justification. You can stand before God based on the righteousness of Christ credited to your account with forgiveness as if you've never sinned against him. Because of Christ. It's Christ's righteousness credited to you. It's your sin credited to Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, in his penalty-paying sacrifice on the cross, and it is right standing before God, forgiven of your sin. That's justification. That is radical justification. You, being a wicked sinner of your father the devil, being brought into right relationship with God as if you hadn't sinned? I mean, that should, that's worth celebrating, right? Amen. Amen. That is amazing. That's radical justification. Justification sets people free. Literally here, that word, apodikaiothenai, set free from. Apodikaiothenai, set free from. Justification sets people free from sin so that they can give their members as instruments of righteousness. So they can sacrifice themselves, give of themselves, Romans 12.1, right? Give of themselves as instruments of righteousness to serve Christ. And this is believes here. This is not through the law. When it says in verse 39, and by him, everyone who believes, that's a biblical faith. It's not believe as in believe a set of facts. It's not believe in a simple sense as if to say, I hold something to be true. This is biblical saving faith. That in first, we've talked about this a few weeks ago in our saving or living faith conference. That faith is God opening eyes to see opening ears to hear so that you understand the veil is lifted and you understand your condition before Christ. You understand the gospel supernaturally through the power of God in giving you the new birth, making you alive in Christ Jesus. You come to understand your condition. You come to understand the gospel. You understand what Christ has done on your behalf and you understand that in the way that God intends through faith. That understanding in the mind works its way into the heart. And you, by heart, with your heart, everything that you are, commit yourself wholeheartedly to Christ. And it bears the fruit of obedience. Bears the fruit of a changed life. Bears the fruit of a radical conversion from the way that you used to live to now your new standing in Christ, living wholeheartedly for him. That is what it means to believe scripturally here. And everyone who believes by him, he is justified from all things, from which it says you could not be justified in the law of Moses. The second half of verse 39 there, justification, this radical justification on your notes, cannot come through Moses. Cannot come through Moses. Moses should drive you to Christ. Don't stay in Moses, go to Christ. And that's where the radical forgiveness comes from. This is free from the penalty and control of all those things they could not get released from under the law of Moses. Now, this is not implying that there were some things that the law of Moses could justify them from. What this is saying is this is contrasting the total efficacy of faith, the total nature of faith to be able to, through faith, by Christ, justify you for everything, everything, unintentional and intentional, that's where the law failed. You could be right with God by faith in Christ. And that faith necessitates repentance. What wasn't happening through the law of Moses. It was impossible through the law of Moses. Reminds me of the story in Luke 18 of the tax collector and the Pharisee in the temple, right? You have the tax collector in the temple beating his breast, can't even lift his eyes to heaven, and he's saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And it says that that man, that humble, 
with the eyes of faith, seeing his own condition, with the eyes of faith, seeing the possibility of God's deliverance, with that understanding, beating his breast in humility, his face in the dust, crying out to God to be merciful, the Bible said that that man went down to his house justified, justified, justification. But now the Pharisee who prided himself in maintaining his righteousness by keeping the demands of the law of Moses, that man was not. That was the Pharisee in the temple. And listen, they prized the law of Moses. Their hope for salvation was bound up in keeping the law. And they thought that they could be right with God by keeping the law. Paul believed that. The man preaching this sermon used to think that way before God knocked him off his horse. And he realized that salvation was all of Christ, right? He thought the same way. This is radical justification. It cannot come through keeping the law. It cannot come through Moses. Turn to Hebrews 10. Let's take a look at this. Hebrews 10. I love the letter to the Hebrews. And there's so much here that informs our understanding of the New Testament in relation to the Old Testament. It is Absolutely, just such a wonderful evidence for the inerrancy, the inspiration of Holy Scripture. This Scripture ties together so completely and so well. We see this throughout. With respect to this issue, see this throughout the book of Hebrews. But in Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 1. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come. The law was merely a shadow. And not the very image of the things can never, with these same sacrifice, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. That's the issue. Those who approach must be made perfect. Must be perfect. Verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. You see that? Verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he, Christ, came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second, establishes faith in Christ, repentant faith that justifies Verse 10, that by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Not every Sunday offering up the sacrificial victim of Christ continuously in the Mass. Christ once for all. Verse 11, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. It is only through the finished work of Christ. Verse 12, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down. That means his work was done. At the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Four by one offering. Do you see that repeated? He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Don't you praise God today? That by Christ you are perfected forever in the same way that that sacrificial animal was irrevocably given to God. You, if you are in Christ, have been irrevocably made a gift to God through faith in Christ. You become His. No one can ever snatch you out of His hand if you're genuinely saved. 
Verse 15, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, verse 19, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus... That was never possible before. It's never possible, but now through the blood of Jesus to enter the holiest, to have access, complete access and communion to God. Verse 20, by a new and living way through, though he, uh, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Praise God. Praise God. Look at this glorious salvation. Look at what God has done in Christ Jesus for you if you will but repent and believe in the gospel. Point two on your notes. Believe on Christ now. Believe this. Believe this today. Now is the time. Believe this to avoid a radical judgment. In the same way, this understanding of sin ramps up to our understanding of our condition and our need for a Savior. In the same way, this warning ramps up. This warning of judgment ramps up. It's building up for you to see, do not reject Christ. Will you cast your lot in with those that crucified him or with those who with humble, contrite hearts? Will you simply see your condition apart from him? Will you see your need for a savior? And will you come to him in repentance and faith? There's a warning that you must do this. Think about what God has done so far for a moment. Think about what God has done through the history of Israel. Think about what God has done in bringing you here. Think about what God has done in giving you his word. Think about what God has done in giving his only son to die on the cross. Think about what God has done. God is a God of great grace. Now in the light of that, imagine for a moment. If God would judge Old Testament Israel for their rebellion against him, Will not God greatly judge New Testament people for their rejection of Christ? The judgment is certain, and it is a great and fearful judgment. And we're going to see that here. God is a God of great grace, but also of great judgment. Sin must be atoned for because God is holy. Your sin will be paid for by you or it will be paid for by Christ. And those are the only options that you have. Sin must be paid for. And the wages of sin is death. And we see that from the sacrificial system already. You must decide. You must decide which side of this prophetic cause you're going to embrace. Which side of this will you embrace? Go back to Acts 13 and let's look at this together. Which side will you embrace? Look at verse 40. Acts 13, down in verse 40. Beware, beware, therefore, lest what, what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Verse 40, rejection necessitates a radical judgment. Beware. Write down Hebrews 12. 25 through 29, I encourage you to look there. We don't have time to go there now. Rejection necessitates a radical judgment. If God judged those in the Old Testament for their sin, God will certainly judge the rejection of his son. Verse 41, Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish. That word perish there is in the passive. It means be destroyed. Marvel at the judgment that is coming and be destroyed. It's the same way that Josephus, the same word that he used to describe those that were killed in the flood. They were destroyed by the flood. Marvel and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, 
the one will declare it to you. This judgment of God is unbelievable. And if you're honest with yourself, even as a disciple of Christ, you've struggled at one point or another with the concept of eternal torment. Eternity in hell. Eternal fire. Eternal judgment. It's difficult to grasp, hard to believe. This is taken from Habakkuk 1.5, where the Chaldeans were about to invade Israel. And on the eve of their ascendancy to power, Habakkuk calls the people to stand in astonishment at the judgment of God. To stand in astonishment at what God is about to do. A great judgment. And now think about it. God brought the Chaldeans through, swept through, obliterated, took them into captivity, judged the people. How much more will God judge those who reject his son? This is, in Christ, the mightiest work of God. The greatest revelation of God. The greatest thing that he has done to redeem sinful man. This is his mightiest work. This is his son. Won't it be a mighty, fearful, astonishing judgment? That's what is being said here. The context here also, look at verse 41. This context necessitates a radical judgment. This reminds me of the parable of the vine dressers, the wicked vine dressers. They send one prophet after another and they kill those men. And the vine dresser says, certainly I will send my son and they will hear him. And they killed his son, wanting to take the vineyard for themselves. And he asked the Pharisees, what would he do? What would he do with these, those wicked men? And even those wicked Pharisees saw the justice in that. They said, certainly he'll destroy those wicked men. And that's absolutely right. God will destroy. Turn back to Amos. Amos, this is an unbelievable and astounding judgment. Look at the justice of God. Amos 9. Amos 9, I'm going to just quickly go through these so you can see this context. Amos chapter 9, verse 1. I saw the Lord, Amos chapter 9, verse 1. I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he said, Strike the doorposts that the thresholds may shake, and break them on the heads of them all. I will slay the last of them with a sword. He who flees from them shall not get away, and he who escapes from them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, from there my hand shall shake them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. And though they hide themselves on top of Carmel, from there I will search and take them. Though they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, from there I will command the serpent and it shall bite them. Though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword and it shall slay them. I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. The Lord of God, the Lord God of hosts, he who touches the earth and it melts, and all who dwell there mourn, all of it shall swell like the river and subdue like the river of Egypt. He who builds his lairs in the sky and has founded his strata in the earth, who calls for the waters of sea and pours them out on the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. If the Lord would judge that way, Certainly, if you reject Christ, it will be a mighty, marvelous, unbelievable judgment. Look back at Leviticus. We've been looking at Leviticus already today. Look back at Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus 26. Those wicked men that reject his son. Certainly, God will destroy those wicked men. Leviticus 26. And beginning... In verse 14, God's instruction to the nation of Israel, but if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgment so that you will not perform all my commandments, but break my covenant, I also will do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you, wasting disease and fever, which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you, and you shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you. You shall flee when no one pursues. You see that? 
And after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze. And your strength shall be spent in vain. For your land shall not yield its produce, nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruit. Then if you walk contrary to me and are not willing to obey me, I will bring upon you seven times more plagues according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, destroy your livestock, make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. And if by these things you are not reformed by me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you, and I will punish you yet seven times for your sins more." And I'll bring a sword against you that will execute the vengeance of the covenant. When you are gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of your enemy. When I have cut off your supply of bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall bring back your bread by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. It's famine. Verse 27, after all this, if you do not obey me but walk contrary to me, then I will also walk contrary to you in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. This goes on and on and on. This is a terrible judgment. A terrible judgment. This terrible judgment, point three on your notes, requires, it necessitates a radical response. A radical response. Back in Acts 13, in verse 42, it simply says that some Jews left Some Jews left. We're going to see them next week in their envy and in their rejection of Christ. But then it says, the radical response, that the Gentiles there begged. Parakalun, begged. There's a sense of urgency there. They had their interest intensely aroused. They begged that these words would be spoken to them. Look at verse 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. They wanted more. They had heard exposition of Scripture before, but never like this. And listen, Paul, this was a sermon of hellfire and brimstone. He just got done speaking to them of great and terrible judgment, so severe that you wouldn't even believe it if someone told you about it. And yet they wanted more. This is the radical response of believing on God, believing on Christ. This is repenting of sin, putting your faith in Christ. And we know for a fact there were many there that day that were radically converted, that got radically saved. But that's, there were others there, like we've talked about. There were others there, verse 43. Now when the, the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. There were those that had a favorable, favorable response but had to be persuaded and had to continue in an understanding of the teaching that they were given. They needed to hear more. They needed to respond. They just hadn't gotten there yet. And so Paul and Barnabas persuaded them to continue. They didn't get hostile yet. But they didn't get humble yet either. They had to be persuaded, needed to be persuaded. Maybe you're here today and you hear the preaching of God's word you hear what God's saying, and in your heart, you're begging God for that forgiveness. You're begging God for the right standing with Him that only comes through Christ. You see your condition. You want desperately to be free from that. Or maybe you've come, and you'll just walk out the door, and next week you'll be just as hard, and next week you'll be just as hard. And maybe one point, some loving brother or loving sister will come to you and they'll attempt to share Christ with you, attempt to talk to you about your soul, and you'll just cut them off and you'll just stay steeled in your rejection, marvel and perish. And yet there are those that may hear what the Word of God is saying and they have a favorable response, but they need to hear more. Don't delay Today is the day of salvation. Follow Christ. This message, this truth from God's word necessitates a radical response. And if you don't see it, then you're blinded and under a veil. That veil is lifted in Christ. Cry out to God for him to lift the veil. 
There is a radical judgment coming, but there is a radical forgiveness if you'll repent of your sin and put your faith in Christ. Follow Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, thank you for this radical redemption. God, thank you for your amazing mercy, your amazing grace. I thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of sins. Lord, our sin is great. I thank you for Christ. Thank you for the sacrifice you made on the cross. God, and thank you for the truth of your word that warns of an impending almost unbelievable judgment. God, we praise you, God, and thank you for your great patience with us, great long-suffering, Lord, in which you offer this free gift of salvation, forgiveness of sins, justification by repentance and faith in Christ. Lord, we praise you and thank you for it. I pray, Lord, that your people, Lord, would be edified, built up to serve you more. What a great salvation that you've given us. But I pray, Lord, that if there are those here who are not saved, they would beg you for forgiveness. Beg you, Lord, as these Gentiles did in the synagogue in Antioch toward Pisidia, to hear this word, to respond to it by turning from their sin and turning to faith in Christ. For your glory, God, for your great name, so that they can escape the wrath that is certainly to come. We praise you, God, for offering this in Christ. And it's in his name and for his glory that we pray all these things. Amen. Amen.